I would know a little bit more what I'm talking about, since I'm not a specialist about the natural language processing. However, I recognize the need <laughs> of it. I will just, I wanted to treat it as a kind of um, platform to further discussion on what can be achieved, what is the need in science for the natural language processing, because we all know about it from the daily base use, like um, um, the tra translation uh, and stuff like this, but how it can be applied in science and what is the need in, uh, in what we all do or might do. So I will share my screen. To start with the presentation. The idea is to just uh, highlight the need so that we start discussing the natural language processing during our meeting uh, came when I started to work at the Center for Evidence-Based Agriculture. We've got such a center here at Harpers. I hadn't known about it when I was a PhD student. However, I think it is worth to know to everybody. And at the beginning, I would like to just discuss what the evidence synthesis is. And then to switch a little bit to the natural language processing, because I would see the links between these two tools. Basically, the evidence synthesis is a tool for informing effective agricultural decision making. I can hear an echo, so let me just slightly decrease the volume. So why do we need reliable evidence? Everybody in the science has a bit of is doing some research, but obviously as a result of um, time constraints and so on, everybody looks at the very limited picture. And if we don't have the broader picture, our overall conclusion might be skewed or even wrong, as we can see in this picture when we examine an elephant and the conclusions what it really is are very different between the people who uh, do some part of the job. And the same kind uh, and the same applies to to the science. If we pick a few papers and analyze them and try to draw conclusions based on what we have read without the broader picture, without access to all the evidence which is already there, we might have a bias, uh, biased conclusions. So let's suppose that we want to know what is the impact of an intervention X on the outcome Y. So rather than carrying out the new research, we could at first look at the existing research and find what the evidence actually is there. What has been published already there? Probably we might find the potential gaps in knowledge when we do so-called the evidence mapping or if there is uh, enough research already done, we might investigate what are the effect of the intervention we analyze, whether they are positive or negative. And basically the size of the study relates to how much effect it has overall, but the evidence synthesis also takes into account not only the size of the study, but also looks into more details into the methodology. And so the because it is also very important to assess the quality of the study which we investigate. And different findings obviously might have uh, different studies might have different findings, and we can then just imagine that we plot the findings on a kind of chart like we have in here. And the strength of the evidence is represented by the size of the re um, rectangular and the overall combined findings are represented here in the blue parallelogram and we can see that the intervention had positive effect on some outcomes that we have specified at the very beginning. 
some of you might think that everybody does it because everybody does literature review for their thesis or dissertations and so on. But actually, the literature review is not a structured methodology, whereas the evidence synthesis is a structured a priori, a priori methodology, which is specifically designed to gather the existing research or evidence to answer a specific question. And this methodology is designed specifically to reduce the bias and obviously, like the every, it, it is designed basically the sa in the same way as we can imagine a laboratory methodology. That if you you take this, um, just reheat it and uh, cool it down and um, add um, some other um, chemicals to obtain certain um, substance. This is a very similar process, which has got a very structured methodology to reduce the bias, and obviously. The overall idea behind it is just to uh, ensure replicability um, so that it can be repeated by other researchers and basically their findings should be very similar to what we have found. Uh, there are lots of methods uh, to so-called knowledge or evidence synthesis. There are 20 of them identified by the ECLI which is the European Union Initiative on Evidence Synthesis. Probably many of you uh, have already heard of um, systematic review or meta-analysis, but you can see that meta-analysis and systematic map or systematic uh, review are just a few out of many other methods. But obviously every method is very uh, complex and it requires uh, high skills to be performed and so people basically specialize themselves in each method. Uh, some of them might uh, be um, qualified to perform a few of these uh, methods, but definitely not all of them. Why should we bother? Uh, there is an example, but I am absolutely positive we could multiply the examples. Uh, when the meta-analysis hadn't been conducted early enough, but if it had, it would, like in this case, which I am quoting here, I think, Ed, you have quoted it at one of our stats meeting long time ago as well. There was a drug uh, being um, investigated as a potential uh, drug for heart disease. And there was enough evidence already there uh, in like 1970s. So if at that point the meta-analysis had been done, it would have saved like 15 years of further primary research. It would have saved a lot of money and obviously it would have saved a lot of um, human lives. So it is very important to Bear in mind that we need to make use of the evidence which is already there instead of repeating the research that someone has already done. There are, however, many challenges in the knowledge or evidence synthesis. Many articles need to be read. At least basically uh, what is suggested is that several hundreds of articles to be read. Obviously, it all depends on the volume of evidence which is there. If there are like 200, we cannot expect to, <laughs> to have 500 or 5,000 5, whatsoever. But it makes sense to do the evidence synthesis if the volume of the existing evidence is robust enough. Since it requires quite uh, a lot of reading. It is long term. Basically, it is estimated that it requires weeks or even months of tedious work of uh, highly skilled researchers. And so it is very costly. Well, obviously, it is much more cost effective in comparison to the primary research, but we cannot expect this method to be for free because anyway, people are involved they are high skilled and this is basically it again requires some time to be performed. Providing the pace of uh, the new research being published, there is a risk of 
uh, missing newest studies because when we start doing the research uh, uh, the since uh, the moment when we just start uh, searching for the evidence new studies might be published which we quite uh, easily might omit providing particularly the uh, the um, timeliness of uh, and the requirement of time for the researchers and often this method does not take into consider uh, consideration uh, other languages than English. Here I have um, included Web of Science. So recently at the Center for Evidence-Based Agriculture, I uh, tried to look for some um, uh, evidence which relates to the uh, lameness in sheep or lamb. To find out how much evidence is there, how many papers include the keywords, you just put the keywords in the searching engine. You, because I was interested in both lamb and lambs, sheep or sheep, and lameness or the sheep was lame and so on, the, uh, the ending was just um, replaced by the asterisk. We can now see that there are over 500,000 papers that include these um, these words. 500,000 is way too too much for a uh, excuse me for a person to read, and so uh, we need to narrow down the searching string. Additionally, we can see that not all the uh, papers that were picked up by this search were relevant. Here we have some very exotic article. I, I even don't know what it has, uh, what it really means, lambda calculus. Uh, but anyway, it has got this root, the lamb inside and uh, and that is why it was picked up by this search. But I as a researcher know that it's not relevant for me. And when I do the screening, I just categorize it as a non relevant. So as I mentioned, given this volume of papers, which we already have, we need to narrow the scope redefine the search string, for example, to add, depending on what we are really looking for, that we are after the lameness in England or in Europe, in US, we can just uh, um, narrow the, the years of publications. Um, but once it is done and agreed with whoever is interested in the systematic review, we do the screening manually, as I have just mentioned with, uh, uh, with this irrelevant article. We just go through the titles and abstracts and just categorize relevant, irrelevant before the full text can be analyzed. And here the natural language processing would be a perfect solution for do quite a lot of <laughs> work <laughs> to help the researcher. We can just imagine that if I can distinguish the relevant and irrelevant article for the lamb, uh, lameness problem in l l lambs or sheep. The same can be done um, by, um, by a, um, NLP, uh, by this um, computer, uh, by this technique, uh, which should potentially support us. So NLP is an application of computational techniques to the analysis and synthesis of natural language and speech. It is used in many applications. We can see and probably quite a lot of you use it to translate uh, some texts if you need. Uh, I am a foreigner. When my mom comes to the UK, she tries to uh, use the Google Translate, uh, which just uses the uh, the process of speech and whenever she gets lost, someone can help her. <laughs> so the NLP is used for this uh, purposes and we all um, probably are familiar with it. But if we think that the automated text classification could save quite a lot of time, which I as a researcher spent um, screening the articles, 
it should be in the very much focus on the evidence synthesis researchers. Because as I mentioned, the searching for so-called grey literature and academic publications is often the most time consuming part of the systematic review. The grey literature, uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this term, it is not the academic publication, it is the we call the great uh, literature, all the reports, the, um, the branch reports, DEFRA reports, sometimes uh, many organizations publish their own reports, guidelines and so on. And they are also a valuable source of knowledge for the knowledge synthesis. If we think of using the NLP, since we would expect it to be much faster than the manual screening, we can expect it will keep most updated volume of the uh, publications to be analyzed. And it is worth knowing that the machine learning classification can now achieve similar performance to manual labeling. This is the information which I have already found. However, I just need to highlight that here at Harper, at the evidence, uh, at, at the Center for the Evidence uh, Synthesis, we don't use the um, the nat natural language processing. Then all the information I'm just talking about, I'm delivering here, um, is just based on what I have read, what I have Googled. Because even myself, I haven't even started doing the systematic review yet. I joined the team quite recently. And basically, my main focus is to do the networking on top of it when the time comes when an additional project will turn up, I will try to get my head around to be more involved in this specific process. Nevertheless, if we talk about the natural language processing, this is what I have already found. Uh, in just a few, very few brief words, probably Ed will expand on it. There is Neil, um, a scientist who is very much involved in um evidence synthesis but also he's very keen on using r and uh, promoting r and uh, developing uh, tools to facilitate the evidence synthesis process and he's he has launched the smr conference evidence synthesis and meta analysis in r i think he started it a couple of years ago only and this information with, which I'm just about to provide you comes from one of the presentation delivered at that conference. So there are many machine learning models, but when I heard a presentation delivered by a scientist who, whose research is how to uh, optimize the machine learning models to do the evidence synthesis. It is suggested that the transformers model is uh, probably the most promising. Uh, it, the text is fed as a whole, which can speed up the process rather than feeding word by word. And the transformers also has a very high accuracy. Obviously, as with the uh, machine learning, the challenge is to prepare enough volume of manually labeled data uh, as the training data set, because the machine learning requires the training data set based on which we can perform uh, the actual research. And the, to prepare the training data set might be quite time consuming as well. But I will be back to it in a moment. But the key feature of the transformers is the self attention. We can have, we can see a um, sentence here. A girl is holding a red ball. And this model, the transformers model, can already see what is related to what, what word is related to what. It recognizes that the ball and red are connected, that holding and the ball are connected, but the red and the girl are not connected. And it is quite important because the self-attention uh, mechanism is able to uh, learn these associations between the words in the text. And so it 
has got a great potential to uh, to build the un the realistic understanding of natural language. And what I have learned from that presentation is that there is a transformers library in Python within which there is a hugging face library. And there, there is a BERT model which can perform the actual screening that we as the scientists might need. It is quite important to use it and because as I mentioned here as a challenge, to prepare the volume of manually labeled data as the training data set might be uh, so much time consuming that applying the machine learning to our screening process would not make much sense. However, the BERT model in the hugging phase already has a huge data set of trained models which we can apply and basically because it has got the repository of these pre-trained language models and based on it we can just uh, apply it and verify whether it was uh, done correctly as we would require or retrain it a little bit and enhance its performance. Although in R there are no tools yet built specifically for the natural language process it, uh, processing, uh, the package reticulate allows to use Python's libraries and uh, whoever is interested in using the NLP, uh, he or she can use it with this package. To The only um, requirement is to have the uh, Anaconda already downloaded on your computer. And it should uh, allow you to use the, uh, the libraries already there in Python and to have access to the BERT model. And I think this is all I can tell you about it because my knowledge in this regard is very, very limited. <laughs> but I think it might give us a kind of thought that it is quite interesting. And uh, as a um, community working in R and uh, doing some research, firstly, that the evidence synthesis is quite an important tool. And secondly, there is a developing machine learning methodology which could just excuse me, uh, help us perform our um, our task in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mecca. Mm -hmm. We're having lots of echoes when I turn my mic on. Somebody turned me off. Maybe you Maybe could turn you yours off. Is that better? Is that better? No. no. <laughs> Hold on, let me mute the uh, mic up here. There, let's test this. Can you hear me? Everyone here can hear me That's because we're in the same room. OK. <laughs> Solved. Um, Magda, that was great. That was a, uh, a very fast overview. I remarked I made a joke while you were talking. Uh, very mild joke at your expense that you were making NLP sound very unattractive. It's very, very hard, you were saying. <laughs> um, the thing that that I think is so compelling about NLP is that for a task like uh, this is a very specific task that you're suggesting. It's the burden of um, an academic sifting through, you know, hundreds literally of papers to do a meta analysis to um, to get what they want. And uh, here is something that even though it is hard, I agree uh, there it's technically demanding it. The promise is that it will do a lot of that work for you and automate it, and therefore it will save you work. If Absolutely. you do a little hard work, it will save you a lot yeah. of work. 
a thing that I really liked about your talk was you mentioned <clears throat> um, transformers, which are a um, relatively new thing. For a, a guy my age, transformers are very, very new. But Five for years. somebody else or a data scientist, um, <laughs> they've been around for a really long time, about five years. Yes, they are. For, One um, of the things you may have heard of for uh, transformers is a, a pre-trained model. Um, so you can build one from scratch. Mm -hmm. The hardest part of building one from scratch is to build the training data set. There probably are some out there. In, in fact, um, um, the uh, meta-analysis group that you showed, I have been to some of those conferences during COVID. I went to them, <laughs> Neil Hathaway. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, he and his group are working on uh, some pre-trained models, but I've, I've always wondered myself, but there's a famous one that we sometimes even get on Radio 4 News it's called the GPT-3. Has anyone heard of GPT-3? I'll put it in chat and you can Google it uh, yourself a little bit later, GPT-3. Now that's uh, something really unexciting like a general pre-trained transformer and it's the third version. But what that allows you to do is, um, because it's a pre-trained model, what it should allow you to do is to take the model weights and train it with just a little bit of data that you give it. For example, if you had 100 abstracts from, um, from, a, um, from a lameness review or something, mm -hmm. and you, you picked another 100 abstracts that, um, that uh, you wouldn't classify in your, in your um, whatever endeavor you wanted to do, your knowledge gap synthesis or whatever, you, uh, in theory, could take a small set of training data like that, just yes or no, should I include this, train it on top of GPT-3, and it, it might do what you want in the first instance. The other thing that you said I liked was highlighting that most of the active development for this kind of tool is happening. All the computer scientists inventing these tools are mostly working in Python. Uh, <clears throat> It's there are various reasons for that, but the libraries are out there. You you highlighted the transformers package, but there are some other ones too. We were not going to use them in the data science MSC. Um, it's just too much. It's just one of the things we can't pack in. But we have done a little bit in here, and I think we did use some of the tools in R. But uh, my at the moment, my belief is that um, it's not fruitful to do this kind of thing in R because you have to go through the extra hoop of using Python anyway through R. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it makes it extra hard. But, but the tools that exist in, um, if you're interested in these, it might be an, an interesting thing for us to do in this group is there's a Hugging Face, the, the organization that makes, um, that's behind the Hugging Face library. Now I think that they're a, um, a company, but they're open. Uh, they're an open research company, and I don't know how they make money if they're funded by a company like Google or something, but uh, they have teamed up with Amazon Web Service in a free tool, uh, and they have a, a, a set of, um, of course tools to use that train you up to use GPT-3 and to build your own transformers. And it might be an idea to do that in one of the future ones in here. I don't know if Iona is in the uh, chat. I'm just going to check if she is. Um, no, I don't see Iona, so I can speak very freely about Iona. <laughs> uh, Iona is interested in, um, in, and she and I have talked, and um, we've talked about Transformers and um, NLP in here because of her interest. For the same reasons, you're probably, are you working with uh, Iona as well? Um, actually, no, because Iona is in another department. You're muted, However, so I'm sorry. I've yeah, asked but we, we, we collaborate. Maybe, but not at the moment. Okay, yeah. we, we could get you. I could read your lips. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what, uh, what Iona, one of the tools that Iona is interested in is for some um, uh, commercial software. SPSS have a module that do machine learning like, like MATLAB, 
like um, like other pieces of commercial software. They're all kind of wanting to implement machine learning tools because they're so popular and they want to make it easier for non data scientists to use these. And uh, I when I look at them, their development time is much slower than and, and because things are changing so fast. If you invest the time to learn and pay, it's quite expensive. The uh, yeah. the NLP module and SPSS several several thousands of pounds for one license. Um, you're already outdated. So um, I don't. I think Iona has that. I would like to ask her. Maybe we'll invite her the next time she's in here to tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. her experience on it. Good. But I, I really have nothing to add on this. Um, it's a kind of model that I'm also interested in, but I haven't done a lot of work with NLP myself, but I am interested. So uh, if you're interested, Magda, in um, looking at the uh, Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab tools that have hugging face, let's do it. Let's put it on the calendar for a month or so. Good. That's all that I have. And because we have another long meeting after this, I'm tempted to, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video here. Are there any questions from anyone for Magda? Uh, 